Thank you for joining us tonight. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Gold text on a white background. Live from NYPL logo. Live from NYPL presents If Then, Jill Lepore with Martine Powers. October 1st, 2020, 8 p.m. EDT. This slide features an image of the book jacket for If Then. Pink and gray block letters on a cream colored background read, If Then, How the Simul Maddox Corporation Invented the Future. Jill Lepore, New York Times bestselling author of These Truths. A series of different colored rectangles appear in various locations on the jacket, seeming to reference a data processing punch card. On the right side of the slide, black text on a white background. If Then is available for purchase online from the library shop, nypl.org slash shop. All proceeds benefit the New York Public Library. Plus, receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary tote bag with your purchase. Black text on a white background. This slide features the same book jacket for If Then, along with the Simply E logo. Reserve a copy of If Then for free with the New York Public Library card, available through Simply E on iOS and Android. Black text on a white background. This slide also features the book jacket of If Then. This title and more are available in accessible formats for community members who do not use standard print. Find out more at nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background, recommended reading. We also recommend these titles for further reading. Turing's Cathedral by George Dyson. Don't Be Evil by Rana Faruhar. The Idea Factory by John Gertner. New Waves by Kevin Nguyen. Uncanny Valley by Anna Wiener. Mind F-Word with an asterisk taking the place of the U by Christopher Wiley. Check out these titles and more on Simply E. Accessible formats available through nypl.org slash talking books. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Gold text on a white background. Live from NYPL logo. Live from NYPL presents If Then. Jill Lepore with Martine Powers, October 1st, 2020, 8 p.m. EDT. This slide features an image of the book jacket for If Then. Pink and gray block letters on a cream colored background read, If Then, How the Simul Maddox Corporation Invented the Future. Jill Lepore, New York Times bestselling author of These Truths. A series of different colored rectangles appear in various locations on the jacket, seeming to reference a data processing punch card. On the right side of the slide, black text on a white background. If Then is available for purchase online from the library shop, nypl.org slash shop. All proceeds benefit the New York Public Library. Plus, receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary tote bag with your purchase. Black text on a white background. This slide features the same book jacket for If Then, along with the Simply E logo. Reserve a copy of If Then for free with the New York Public Library card, available through Simply E on iOS and Android. Black text on a white background. This slide also features the book jacket of If Then. This title and more are available in accessible formats for community members who do not use standard print. Find out more at nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background, recommended reading. We also recommend these titles for further reading. Turing's Cathedral by George Dyson. Don't Be Evil by Rana Faruhar. The Idea Factory by John Gertner. New Waves by Kevin Nguyen. Uncanny Valley by Anna Wiener. Mind F-Word with an asterisk taking the place of the U by Christopher Wiley. Check out these titles and more on Simply E. Accessible formats available 
through nypl.org slash talking books. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Live from NYPL Logo. Live from NYPL presents If Then, Jill Lepore with Martine Powers, October 1st, 2020, 8 p.m. EDT. This slide features an image of the book jacket for If Then. Pink and gray block letters on a cream colored background read If Then, How the Simulmatix Corporation Invented the Future. Jill Lepore. New York Times bestselling author of These Truths. A series of different colored rectangles appear in various locations on the jacket, seeming to reference a data processing punch card. On the right side of the slide, black text on a white background. If Then is available for purchase online from the library shop, nypl.org shop. All proceeds benefit the New York Public Library. Plus, receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary tote bag with your purchase. Black text on a white background. This slide features the same book jacket for If Then, along with the Simply E logo. Reserve a copy of If Then for free with a New York Public Library card, available through Simply E on iOS and Android. Black text on a white background. This slide also features the book jacket of If Then. This title and more are available in accessible formats for community members who do not use standard print. Find out more at nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background, recommended reading. We also recommend these titles for further reading. Turing's Cathedral by George Dyson. Don't Be Evil by Rana Faruhar. The Idea Factory by John Gertner. New Waves by Kevin Nguyen. Uncanny Valley by Anna Wiener. Mind F-Word with an asterisk taking the place of the U by Christopher Wiley. Check out these titles and more on Simply E. Accessible formats available through nypl.org slash talking books. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Gold text on a white background. Live from NYPL logo. Live from NYPL presents If Then, Jill Lepore with Martine Powers, October 1st, 2020, 8 p.m. EDT. This slide features an image of the book jacket for If Then, Pink and gray block letters on a cream colored background read, If Then, How the Simulmatics Corporation Invented the Future. Jill Lepore, New York Times bestselling author of These Truths. A series of different colored rectangles appear in various locations on the jacket, seeming to reference a data processing punch card. On the right side of the slide, black text on a white background. If Then is available for purchase online from the library shop nypl.org slash shop. All proceeds benefit the New York Public Library. Plus, receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary tote bag with your purchase. Black text on a white background. This slide features the same book jacket for If Then, along with the Simply E logo. Reserve a copy of If Then for free with a New York Public Library card, available through Simply E on iOS and Android. Black text on a white background. This slide also features the book jacket of If Then. This title and more are available in accessible formats for community members who do not use standard print. Find out more at nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background. Recommended reading. We also recommend these titles for further reading. Turing's Cathedral by George Dyson. Don't Be Evil by Rana Faruhar. The Idea Factory by John Gertner. New Waves by Kevin Nguyen. Uncanny Valley by Anna Wiener. Mind F-Word with an asterisk taking the place of the U 
by Christopher Wiley. Check out these titles and more on Simply E. Accessible formats available through nypl.org slash talking books. Hello. Um, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Um, my name is Aidan Flax Clark, and I'm the Associate Director for Public Programs at the New York Public Library. And I am lucky enough to be here to welcome you to this conversation with Joe Lepore about her new book, If Then. Um, she's going to be speaking about that book with Martine Powers, the host of the Washington Post's excellent daily podcast, Post Reports. Um, for those of you not yet familiar with the book, if Then is a, about a forgotten till now company called Simulmatics. Um, they were in the business of data science from the late 1950s until 1970. And they built a computer with the totally non-threatening name, the people machine. Um, its job says Jill in the book was to predict and manipulate human behavior, all sorts of human behavior from buying a dishwasher to countering an insurgency to casting a vote. Um, and of course that bears no resemblance to today. So who knows why we're here. Um, you can learn much more about it tonight, of course, and even more by purchasing the book, which is available for sale at the library shop. You can go to on.nypl.org slash shop live to get your copy now. That's again, on.nypl.org slash shop live. Um, the link will also be in the Zoom chat. We'll put it in YouTube. It was in the reminder email, so you really can't miss it. And you got to buy the book now because it's thoroughly entertaining and totally fascinating. Um, purchase it now and you'll also receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary NYPL tote to carry the book around in. Um, real quick before I invite Joan Martine on, uh, just a few housekeeping items. First of all, uh, this event is being recorded, not yourself, just what you see on screen. Um, secondly, if you have questions for Jill, she's ready to answer them. You can put them in the Q&A box in Zoom. You can put them in the chat in YouTube. You can even email them to us at publicprograms at nypl.org and she'll answer as many of them as she can. And you know what, while you're in the chat, say hello, let us know where you're from, what you're reading. We really wanna hear from you. Um, Real-time captions are available for tonight's program via stream text. That link you received in the reminder email after you signed up and we'll also put them in Zoom and YouTube. Lastly, we have really great events coming up in October. Um, on Monday, Kei Ming Chang, who was just named one of the National Book Foundation's Five Under 35, is going to talk about her extraordinary debut novel, um, Bestiary. A week from today, legendary Washington Post editor Len Downey will be joined by a panel of journalists, including Judy Woodruff, to talk about his new book and about, you know, what's going on with journalism today. Um, we also have great events about women at the forefront of climate justice, um, a secret language used by thieves in Germany, uh, what else do we have? A political roundtable with contributors from the New York Review of Books, all kinds of great stuff. You can see all the events at nypl.org slash live and sign up for them, of course. Or you can also get our newsletter, Connect, by going to nypl.org slash connect to stay on top of not only our events, but everything that's going on around the library. Um, okay, that's what I've got. So please, let's bring on Martine Powers and Jill Lepore. Hi, thanks for being with us. Hello. Hey. Hi, Jill. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Good. Um, so Jill, I'm very excited to talk to you about your book. Um, first of all, because actually before I was even asked to do this, my first uh, interaction with your research on this was um, you, know, you had a New Yorker article in early August um, and it was titled How the Simulmatics Corporation Invented the Future. And I remember looking at it and being like, the Simulmatics Corporation, this feels like a thing from the 60s that I'm supposed to know about, but I don't <laughs> know about, like how I didn't know about Neil Young until very recently. <laughs> So I went to Wikipedia and I was like, oh, I'm going to you know, read about this on Wikipedia so I can catch up and actually know what this is as I start this article. And Wikipedia had a four sentence entry about simulmatics. Um, and sentence three was this company is the subject of a book by Jill Lepore. So that is all to say that it seems like no one has really heard of this company before, um, or at least people aren't talking about it now. And so I was just curious to hear from you about how you came to hear about Simulmatics and why you wanted to focus on this for, for this book. 
Yeah, I, I can pass. It's a bit of a weakness of mine that I like really obscure topics. I love writing about stuff that no one's ever heard of before. It violates all kinds of rules for me to write about stuff that's really well known. It's hard to find something surprising to say. If everybody had heard of somatics, what would they be left to say? Um, but it, you know, in many ways, it, it left um, it left a very long shadow, but the shadow of a very small man. You know, the way the light kind of tilts. Um, I came across the story of somatics in 2015. I had an assignment from the New Yorker to write about to an essay trying to take stock of the polling industry from a historical vantage, and it became really quickly clear to me that polling was has been for a while now in the process of being replaced by data science. Like, why would you call somebody, you know, call up thousands of people and ask them a hundred questions when you can just find out what people would answer by gathering their data? So um, I was really interested in when that transformation began and I couldn't quite figure it out. I mean, the modern polling industry starts in 1935 when George Gallup starts doing his work. And now we have this chaos, but where was, where was that turn? Um, and the only thing I could find was a reference to this, this work of this so cool sounding simulmatics. It sounds like the Parallax Corporation or some like 60s conspiracy film company. Um, yeah. And, and then there was really, you know, there's like two articles about it and um, a journal article, a great journal article about what, the, what this company had done in Vietnam. And then I was, so I was intrigued, but um, I couldn't find any archives. You know, the first thing as a historian you do is you go to try to find somebody's papers or a company's records and the company didn't have any records anywhere. But a lot of the men who worked for the company had papers. And one set of papers was at MIT in Cambridge, which is where I live. So I biked over and went through the papers and just I kind of you know fell out of my chair with like wow and they did this and they did this and it's 1962 and they're running election simulations for the New York Times to speed reporting on election night during the midterms and they just they kind of have a hand in everything and it just filled in a lot of holes for me in my story of technological change in the 20th century. Yeah, well, you describe it as that the, the trajectory of this company is kind of a, a shadow history of the 1960s, which I thought was so true from from reading it. So, so I think for for folks who haven't read it, what like what did this company actually do? And I feel like the maybe it's a two part question of what did they promise to do, and then what were they actually you know what did they actually achieve? Um, what they set out to do was to convince the leaders of the Democratic Party in particular that whoever would be the candidate for president in 1960 to pay attention to black voters. Um, they had a kind of black votes matter, political commitment as civil rights, as strong civil rights liberals, and they were frustrated with the Democratic Party. Um, so their intentions were to figure out a way <laughs> to just budge the party away from its segregationist attachments um, to be willing to jettison Southern white Southern conservatives in favor of black voters in the North. And that was a tricky thing to, yeah. Not just like a, an ethical perspective, but they looked at the numbers and they were like, if you wanna win, this is a path to win. Right, right. Well, and you know, you'd, I think they thought the, the political position was clear, right? The right thing to do was to take a stronger position on civil rights but that didn't seem to be persuading Democratic candidates. So um, there were also a bunch of people who were really fascinated by this this kind of work. So they, um, they, they did have this initial project, which was to build, to come up with um, a mathematically representative uh, version of the electorate that they could use to run in a, a simulation where they could ask their, their so-called people machine questions about issues and down to the narrowest possible demographic, see what the response would be and how voters' positions might change. And, and they did that and they did a bunch of other projects for the Kennedy campaign after Kennedy became the Democratic nominee. And when he won, they took credit for his election. It's an interesting evidentiary question whether, you, whether it was fair of them to take credit for, you know, companies take credit for all kinds of stuff that they really don't necessarily, haven't necessarily demonstrated that they did. Um, and but then they got, the campaign was pretty mad about that afterward, that this company was going around saying that we got, you know, we were Kennedy's secret weapon. He used our data to know what to do in the campaign and that it kind of undermined, you know, or that they questioned whether that was actually true. And also that, that it took away from Kennedy's success, that 
that yeah, it yeah. The Kennedy came was, campaign was really pissed off and denied ever having even heard of the company. And I think they 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 understood that this was a really controversial thing to do. Um, it's in some ways not controversial now. We understand that anyone running for office is going to be gathering data and running simulations and getting campaign advice from a for-profit company like that. But it was controversial at the time. And I think they thought that the Simulmatics guys would keep it secret. And also they were academics and many of them worked for the government and they did secret research. But, but, but what they didn't understand is what I think it had been the, the game plan all along of the Madison Avenue guy who was the president of the company, that he would, he, if he could pull this thing off and help Kennedy get elected, that of course he was gonna take credit. He was preparing for a public stock offering of the company which uh, he undertook in May of 1961, just you know, a few months after Kennedy is inaugurated. So he's of course going to go after all kinds of publicity, claiming you know that he had you know built built the whole campaign. Um, so, but it, the debate that that's had in the country when this story comes out is really interesting because a lot of newspaper editorials are published where people say, okay, it doesn't even really matter whether whether this people machine worked or not, like whether Kennedy took its advice. We do know that it advised him to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and those were good things to do. So pretty soon won't everybody be using these things? And eventually why would we need voters anymore? So mm -hmm. it raises all kinds of questions that are just haunt us and unsettle us so profoundly today. I mean, even this week, this very day, you know, thinking about the relationship between who we are as voters and how our political universe works, translating us into data. Yeah. And we still have it. These questions were, it's just, it's very chilling to read the newspaper stuff from 1960, 1961, where people are like, where will this go in 50, 60 years time? Well, I, you know, couldn't More, go any place worse than, it, than here, yeah. Well, what, what I found interesting was, you know, in some ways, it seems like what they did in the Kennedy campaign, that you see the direct correlation between then and now. And like, of course, it would make sense that they were using, you know, using polling and using data and predictive analytics, because that makes sense to us from an election context. But seeing what they tried to do after that, where they were trying to predict counterinsurgency in, in Vietnam and trying to predict when and how and where people would riot in the civil rights movement. I mean, that stuff I found really surprising just from the, the idea of like, how could data even do that? Those situations are so much complicated and and it seems it it's it's it seems arrogant that they thought that they could do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean one really kind of important piece of perspective to take here is to remember this company did not have any computers. Like people didn't have computers. So, you know, they rented a computer. They, you know, there was a com one computer at MIT for all the universities in New England. And, you know, IBM had computers that you could rent at its service center in New York. Um, so they're doing a lot of data gathering and mathematical modeling and then some programming and running some numbers with, you know, and collecting punch cards and writing programs in Fortran. But it's not, um, this kind of data science isn't, um, you know, it doesn't involve banks of servers. Like when we think of the kind of anonymous uh, data center, that's not, that's not th this world. But what they do have, what they lack in the uh, sophistication of the, of the machinery, they gain in the sophistication, or at least their seeming sophistication in their own minds, of models of human behavior. So all of that prediction really does in fact come from wartime research. And if you think about the ideological cold war, not the arms race of missiles uh, and satellites, but the minds race as it was called at the time of trying to predict the behavior of the Soviets and also trying to stop messages that are coming from uh, communist nations to nations that are not communist mm -hmm. and uh, manipulate those messages or target your own messages to particular people. This whole body of work that's part of the ideological battle that's waged during the Cold War is all about thinking of human behavior as something that can be predictable. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, you know, there's incredible work in the field of the history of science that thinks about the Cold War as, as a, a huge turn in the history of ideas where suddenly political battles are battles for the future, for the ideas that will be held in the future, right? In this kind of Manichaean battle between communism and capitalism. So 
when those guys who are doing that as kind of Cold War activity want to think about, well, what are some other ways we could do this work, right? Where, what are other places? We know how to gather demographic data and personal data about populations, um, to try out messages on those populations, to try to direct behavior through targeted messages and manipulate behaviors and distract people from messages that they're already getting. This whole body of research on that. Where else could we use that? Oh, well, we could use that in domestic elections. And so it makes a lot of sense that the that that ambition is there, but all then the the work that this company and others like it go on to do, counterinsurgency in Vietnam or uh, race riot prediction in the United States, is just another version of that same basic model of the Cold War, right? How do you prevent people from holding ideas that you don't want them to hold? Yeah. But it also seems notable that those are some of the situations where they seem to fall short. You describe their uh, their data gathering techniques in Vietnam, where it's clear that these people have basically no idea what they're doing and asking the wrong questions of people in Vietnam and that it's um, uh, kind of a, a half-baked execution. Um, and in terms of the the corollaries between what I see from, from, from Similanix, and, and what we see now is this idea that these that these machines and that the thinking behind these machines are not necessarily intended for people other than white men. Um, and you wrote um, that their 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 big goal was how to train machines to behave like humans, by which they meant men. And then there are all these other situations where it seems like women are sort of not really incorporated into how they're thinking about these models and in ways that end up being bad for them. Um, and, and I feel like that just is just so salient for now when we think about the ways that the algorithms that we use in day-to-day -day life are still clearly intentioned for white men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's really not unlike the history of medicine, right? Where drug trials historically are done on men and we don't know very much about the effects of certain drugs on, on women's bodies, on female bodies. Um, and what the women's health movement did to critique that. There, and there is a kind of feminist movement around data and data science and its, its own, its own um, sexual and gender and, and racial biases. Um, but it, it's quite striking to go back to this, like we, we think so much about that now and kind of looking ahead, but for me, it's striking to go back and see where did that start and why did it start in the way that it started? And when you see these guys, it's the 1950s. You know, it's kind of the heyday of Freudianism. Most of these guys, you know, have been analyzed to within an inch of their lives. They're, they've kind of really swallowed Freudianism whole. Mm -hmm. It informs how they think about women and people of color and anyone who might envy them. Um, they're fascinated by that as a model for the, the sort of mysteriousness of other people. And what they, 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 and they're baffled by other people, but the way that they come to think that many, you know, many of these people who work in this field seem to come to think that the great opportunity, you know, in, in, mainframe computers in the 1950s is incredibly exciting. Like, you know, the speed with which they can um, conduct mathematical operations is, is thrilling, but what else could we do? Well, oh, we could make an artificial intelligence and we could, we could teach this thing, something that would, you know, come to be called machine learning. But the way in which that whole model just disavows any other kind of knowledge or any other kind of intelligence, like one of the um, really important scientists for Simulmatics, a guy named Bill McPhee is married to this fascinating woman named Minnow McPhee who had trained in child development and she was a nursery school teacher. And she has three kids and she's home raising the kids while also being, you know, raised, supporting him through graduate school as a nursery school teacher. And you sort of have to say, who understands human behavior better than a nurse school teacher? Mm -hmm. um, but that kind of, you know, he's forever mocking her, um, demeaning her, she, like her knowledge does not count. Uh, so the idea that you would you know, write code, program a machine to learn and to behave like a human in the absence of an ability to understand, you know, the humans around you, your own, you know, your wife, your wife and your children, that kind of really painful irony, I, I think it does cast a really, really long shadow in that weird arrogance of Silicon Valley. Like we will just build a machine to fix this, to understand this, to solve this. Um, 
not the way a lot of us would go about things. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I found very compelling from the book too, is, is your choice to also focus on the people around these men from this, this corporation and, and the women in their lives and the, the way that those women were overlooked. And it feels like a kind of unusual choice for like the history of, of this company, um, but is, is really powerful. Yeah, I wish I could even have done more with that. The thing that was great about um, Minnow McPhee is that she she was from Colorado and she was living in New York during the whole period of the company's history. She wrote home to her mother. She's really close to her mother. She writes these endless letters home and her granddaughter had transcribed all of these letters. This is incredible archive of, you know, very much like she's she she's walked out of the house in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, you know, the Edward Albee play. Um, this these strained faculty marriages full of masculine contempt and female frustration and thwarted sexual energy and because the you know the um i remember when my dad when i was a kid we would always go to these kind of staff picnics like there'd be family picnics from work where like you'd have to bring along your wife and your kids and they do that at somomatics all the time like they spend summers together on these retreats and the women are you know they're they're passing back and forth, you know, this kind of wilted paperback copy of Peyton Place, which is this really sexy, racy <laughs> novel. And so just like this intensity of this kind of sexual frustration and this weird, the weird desire to perfectly analyze and predict human behavior on the part of people whose own human relationships are crumbling around them. It seems to me to capture so much that um, that we tend to miss about the 1950s and 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, I think we tend to focus on one of those stories or the other, but maybe not both at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I also, um, I just really loved the anecdote from um, when the computer was first brought to the New York Times, I guess that was 1962 and Simul Maddox is like, oh, we're gonna help you go gangbusters on this election. And that uh, that no one knew how to use these computers in, except for the women who had been using them before. Can you tell that story? Cause I just think it's highly entertaining. Yeah, well, I mean, I think if you know, people have seen Hidden Figures, they have some sense of this story. Um, the guys who ran Simulmatics and worked for Simulmatics were some of the nation's most distinguished, distinguished social scientists, sociologists, political scientists, um, and other behavioral scientists. Computer guys, their computer programmer guys, a guy from IBM who was the first guy to program a computer that played chess. And then there's, and then there are businessmen, and they're, you know, they're full of um, kind of razzle dazzle salesmanship, and they they wildly underbid IBM to get this contract with the New York Times to run its election night coverage in the midterms in 1962. And, um, you know, the New York Times doesn't have a computer, uh, but they arranged for the Times to borrow this giant set of machines from IBM that they have to like reinforce the trucking bays to just even get them into the building and they take over the entire editorial floor. Um, have you ever seen, have you ever seen the 1957 film Desk Set? I have not. <laughs> Okay, well, it's sort of a similar story is um, Catherine Hepburn works at a television broadcasting company and they bring in a giant computer that Spencer Tracy has designed. He's an MIT engineer, but like displaces all of the people. They're just, you know, the computers in this era are just it's like room size, many different bits and pieces. And it's gonna be really complicated to do the project that they've bid to do, which is to get election returns from the AP wire service and then punch those returns into punch cards and then feed them into the machine and then transform to magnetic tape and then use a modem to go to the IBM service center that can process on a faster computer. And it's like just many, and there's cords all over the floor and they do test run after test run after test run. And the guys from Somematics just, they literally don't know how to use the machines because nobody has, come like the computers are not installed in places like that. Um, they're set aside in separate buildings where they're worked on solely um, by very particular technicians who tend to be women because what's generally happened is that women who were the women of the typing pool, and this happens in Hidden Figures as well, the, the, the female staff are the typing pool and programming a computer is seen to be just an extension of typing. Mm -hmm. So they hire, you know, all these places just generally turn women who were typists into programmers and they call them computers. The women are called computers. 
um, cause they're, com they're doing the com that, that computing. Um, you know, there's a scene in Hidden Figures where one of these women um, is denied access to her local public library. Um, it's this crazy race story. And, um, but she managed to smuggle out a copy of uh, Fortran manual. Um, so we, you know, all kinds of women learn how to code and are really proficient at coding and they can also run the machines and fix the, you know, like the jam and the photocopier kind of stuff. But the guys at Simulmatics can't do it. So election night comes and they keep hiding their unfamiliarity with the machinery. And they also just don't even understand why anyone would expect them to be able to use the machinery. They're much better than that. They're much, you know, they're much higher up the kind of food chain. They're these distinguished scholars from Johns Hopkins and MIT. And um, so the whole thing is a fiasco and they keep calling, you know, the New York Times, like we got to get some girls over here. We got to get some girls and they keep calling IBM and say, can you send us some girls? Can you send us some girls? Cause they need some people who can run the machines. Yeah, no, it's, it's very beautiful. I love it. Um, I, I'm curious about what your conversations were like with the people who are still alive, who were a part of Symbolmatics or close to Symbolmatics. I mean, did, do they have a feeling that they have been overlooked in history and that they, you know, that they played this crucial role in the, the development of, of predictive modeling and that they're not adequately recognized for that? No, um, most of the people I talked to were children of people who were at Simulmatics and they were mostly baffled by what their fathers did. Um, <laughs> and so kind of curious to find out. Um, some of them were concerned about what their fathers did and others of them were you know, intrigued, um, but they really didn't, you know, did, did, not, did not have too much of a sense of it. Um, I did talk to some people who were adults at the time who didn't work at the company or who worked at the company. Uh, like I talked, to, uh, I talked to a woman who was um, a secretary in the New York office. Uh, and she knew that it was like, there was a lot of fishy stuff going on, but she said you know, she just really didn't actually understand what they were doing. Um, and then I talked to of the, of the um, I talked to two um, Vietnamese Americans who worked for the company when they were in Vietnam before they came to the United States um, you know, after 1975, and he worked as translators and interpreters, and they, they too didn't have like some big picture sense of what the, you know, they were young, very young women who were working as interpreters. Um, they just thought it was all hooey, like they had a lot to say about what they thought was silly about the idea of going out to these villages and asking people what they would watch on TV if they had a TV. Um, but I did talk to, um, I did talk to some guys who were graduate students who worked for the company when they were in graduate school and they did have a sense that it was that it was quite important work and it was because it was it was much closer to their work and I think they also sensed um I haven't talked to them since the book came out that the work in Vietnam although widely condemned by the Department of Defense and ultimately terminated uh, because it was considered to have been useless and possibly quite fraudulent um, mm -hmm. That I think there are a lot of very well-intentioned people who did a lot of that field work as young graduate students who were there um, because they didn't want to fight in the war because they were opposed to the war, that they thought that winning hearts and minds was the better way to save South Vietnam uh, from North Vietnam. So I think there, you know, it, when you, I think for a lot of people who were, who did have some sense of what the company was doing in Vietnam, it caused an enormous amount of family strife. Um, most of the sons of the scientists were opposed to the war. Most of the scientists refused to go to Vietnam and left the company because they were opposed to the war. Um, this is a very ethically troubling piece of the company story. But nobody would say, oh, you know, it wasn't, a, it was a tiny failed company. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that what's so fascinating to me is how much it anticipated, how much, uh, in particular, Ed Greenfield, who was the president of the company, thought of and dreamed of long before it was possible to actually do it or certainly to do it well. Mm -hmm. um, and how then, how clarifying it was for me to think about so much that we experience online now as essentially coming out of the Cold War. So much of that, like messing with your head that happens all day when you're on Google and you get the next you know, web page you go to, you get an ad for something that you're just telling your friend about how you like those sneakers or you know whatever, like that's that mm, you're never left alone. Like, how much of that comes out of Cold War psychological warfare? 
um, I don't know, just really was a missing link for me. Yeah. But, but if this company did anticipate so much and did have such a, a vision for the, for the future that really came to pass in many ways, why is it that they failed and that people don't really know about them anymore? Well, for one thing, um, if you think about, uh, I, I worked with this incredible guy at MIT, Guy Fedorka, who's trying to help me. We found the original punch cards from the 1960 election study and we had them optically scanned. We're going to try to rerun the study using modern computers. Oh, no way. Uh, it was super cool. We almost got it to work. I still think it might work one day. <laughs> um, but as he was pointing out to me, you know, they had for that election study, which was the biggest project they did, they had um, one tenth of the, of the, um, they had one ten thousandth of the number of users that say Facebook has, like in it, in, in, of individuals that they knew stuff about. Um, it's Their data is really, really small. And that was the biggest, that was the most massive possible collection you could have at that time. And it was their 1960 election study was the single largest social science research project ever conducted just in terms of the, the bigness of the data, but in everything else that they wanted to do. So for instance, they go to MGM. They have this idea that's a little bit like, you know, Amazon Prime or something or Netflix. Um, they want to be able to tell MGM, you know, in what theaters to play their, which films um, and at which price, like they want to kind of micro target um, theatrical releases. Mm -hmm. And they have this whole elaborate mathematical model with which to do it. And they go to MGM and then one of the guys sends a memo back to MIT or to New York and he says, you're not even going to believe this. MGM doesn't, they have no data. Like they don't have any idea who sees any of their movies. Like they just send the reels out to like the same movie houses that they have been sending out since the days of vaudeville and they take in the ticket money and that's it. Like they, they don't have, they have nothing. So like, if you wanted to build Netflix in 1963, which is when this is going on, like, what are you going to do? You have to, you'd have to do this enormous amount of market research to get enough data to then create a model. And then you're gonna charge that to MGM so that it's gonna make marginally more money on its movie distribution. They're just gonna say, no, like, we'll just eyeball it. They'll be like, you know, we know they like Westerns in Kansas. Like what they don't, what, what more do they really need to know? <laughs> I love that. Well, so when you look at, when you look at what the company achieved, what it aimed to do, but also what the concerns were about it even back then, what do you feel like is the lesson learned? Like, do you, do you see those concerns of people who, you know, all the way back in, in the early sixties were like, this is dangerous. This could be too powerful. You know, we need to think twice about that. Do, do you see that as a uh, encouraging that we're like, um, you know, what the, the kinds of ideas that we need to be remembering as we think about our technology now, or, or what do you think is the big takeaway as we look for, or look at our current technological landscape? So I can give you a few different answers to that question. So one, the, the chief critic of the Somomatics Corporation wrote a, a dystopian novel about the company that was published in 1964. And um, it was his view that the company, while well-intentioned, was fundamentally naive about the possible unintended consequences of this work, but that, but that as, he, as he saw it as a political theorist, it would, it would ultimately undermine institutions that support democracies and ultimately democracy itself. Some sense of that panic was very much on display in the early 1960s. There's another novel about Simulmatics also published in 1964 that is basically the, the story on which the matrix is based. So you could follow out, you know, two, I'm just gonna sort of say like, you, these people are interested in the future, right? So like, let's test their predictions. So mm -hmm. this one guy's like, look, it's gonna destroy democracy. Well. <laughs> Maybe he was right. This other guy's like, you know, we're going to all be living in a simulation before long. Um, if you've seen The Matrix, something about being shut down and locked up feels a little bit <laughs> like yeah. being in that, the, whatever that thing is called. I mean, it's not like we're, we're not living in that simulation. There aren't alien robots or whatever running are running our lives and we're not even living them. But I think there's a there's a gestalty way in which we feel like we're living in a simulation and we're profoundly isolated and alienated. Um, 
And then there were some uh, other predictions, two more predictions I'll offer up. One is from um, the chairman of the Symptomatics Research Board who when questioned about the people machine that got Kennedy elected or allegedly did, says, you know, I know there's been a lot of criticism, ethical criticism of doing this kind of work. But I wanna say, you know, I believe in, I'm a scholar, I'm a scientist, I believe in the production of knowledge and I believe in the diffusion of knowledge. So what I would say is a political candidate wants the most information possible about uh, his constituency and he you know, meant his and, and in order to, to wage a campaign and be a responsive elected official. Um, so the only real critique I can see of the knowledge that we're making available to such a candidate or such an office holder is that his political opponents in a campaign would um, he would have an unfair advantage over them. So I say to you, we just need two people machines or if everybody has a people machine, then it, then the, all these ethical objections make no sense because then we've diffused the knowledge. Yeah. Well, in a way that's also true, right? Like we do have, we have many people, people machines now. Is, and he was like, that's progress. That's what progress is. The production and diffusion of knowledge. But I, I think there are real questions about whether that counts as progress. Um, and then the, the last, um, prediction I'll give is, is that same guy, the chairman of the Cinematics Research Board, who says in 1968, in 50 years time, we will have, I will have the ability to sit at my desk and using a, a computer in my own house that will be connected to computers all over the country. I would be able to find out if someone was applying for a job. I'd be able to see his academic transcripts, his social security records, his veterans, military records, his veterans records, whether he had a criminal record, I'd be able to find out if anyone in his family had a history of drug use or had ever been arrested. I'd be able to find out his IQ, uh, his blood type. I'll be able to find out all those things. The question is, should I? But that's a question for people 50 years down the road to answer. He's, <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate move in the 1960s is we are building such cool shit. <laughs> you know, it, it's gonna be really interesting to see where this takes people in the future. As opposed to, we're building some stuff that kind of could go badly. Like, remember the Manhattan Project? Yeah. Um, but the, it's- it's the, the idea it's, that you just build the tools and then- just build it, yeah. We'll create the ethics around it to make sure that they're used well, rather than thinking about maybe we shouldn't build the tools. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's, I, I think, what I found really clarifying and helpful in hearing people's reactions to this in the moment in the 60s, because I think it is very important to remember, to remember what it feels like to, to see a presidential candidate use data in these really um, in this, these really new and surprising ways and be like, I'm actually not sure that I'm okay with that. Like remembering a time when that wasn't just the expectation. And I think that it kind of helps us reset our expectations of, of like these, these tools have not always existed. These expectations of what's possible weren't always there. And maybe we should remember what it felt like before to adequately assess what we're dealing with right now. Yeah, and I think the big turn, I don't know that I write about this as much as I might have in the book, but the, the big turn that's worth remembering from a, a, a you know longer historical vantage is what people did get really worried about in the 1960s and then especially in the 1970s was not companies like the Simulmatics Corporation collecting your data and predicting your behavior and trying to manipulate it. They were worried about the US federal government doing all of those things mm -hmm. because the government is really the only, like to have, enough computing power and enough data, only the government really does. And then the government is abusing that, right? Like, so in Vietnam um, with surveillance on civil rights activists and other political dissidents, uh, the secrecy and cover up of Watergate, uh, so that all the political energy around being worried about the collection of data that that is expressed over the course of the 1960s and into the 1970s, just focuses like a laser on the federal government. Mm -hmm. Oh no, the federal government cannot have these powers. Um, and it's where the, the kind of left critique meets what, you know, what becomes Reaganism, right? And makes possible the dismantling of, of, of the New Deal state, right? Is just this agreement, like the federal government is so scary. They're even collecting our data now. Um, but meanwhile, <laughs> who's actually dangerous are all the corporations who are doing yeah. that and who are increasingly <laughs> gaining the ability to do this. Um, but it's like, it's like, you know, you're busy watching the gardener who you think is misplanting your rose bushes, 
But meanwhile, a thief has taken your computer and your television and all your silverware. Like you're just looking in the wrong place. Yeah, yeah. So what is your take on these, on the people behind this corporation? I mean, do you think that they had good intentions from the beginning and that things got complicated, but that their vision for, for what was possible, you know, has some things to admire in it? Or do you feel like they were, that, that they were the evil geniuses? Oh, they weren't the evil geniuses. They really weren't. And, and I, I kept waiting to find somebody who might've been quite villainous and there really isn't. Um, I think there's some, there's some people that are like better than other people, but the, the real visionary of the company is Ed Greenfield, who, who's this Madison Avenue ad guy. He's immensely charming. Um, I think he, you know, betrays his wife in a very terrible way and it's a tragic family story unfolds as a consequence but that also destroys him he's a person who knows that he's 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 responsible for this terrible family tragedy but what I you know later in his life you know after the company goes bankrupt and he gets lost to his own alcoholism um he comes up with an idea another he keeps wanting to restart some omatics like it was his best idea. It was his genius idea. And you know, when people's lives fall apart, they often want to go back to the moment just before their life fell apart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think this is true of schizophrenics, right? Like your life's going fine and then you have that first breakdown. People are always trying to somehow get back to that moment. Mm -hmm. He's always trying to get to the moment where he had the idea that was like on the pulse of the nation. Like it was just like really saw what could be and um, he comes up with a new name for this. He wants to call it the Mood Corporation. He wants to start it all. He wants to start all over again. He's going to get investors. He's going to have a public offering, and they're going to be because now there's this is you know this is like by the late seventies and eighties. Now there is the data, and now there's like the beginnings of the personal computer. Like it's before the Apple, but after the PC, like the the, the computers are like look linked up on the ARPANET and. You know, you can do time sharing and like you there's you can store data on all these like big floppy disks like we could do so much now and we could what we could do we could build a machine that could sense everyone's mood. <laughs> Therefore, we could give that you know we could sell that as a commodity to companies that are trying to sell like should you sell, should you sell, you know, a sexy red dress this week and put that in the front of your store, or is this really the week that you want to have the floral sundress out? Because what's the mood in that neighborhood? Like you could have the day. And it's so Facebooky, like it's just to me so so totally Facebooky. And he, you know, like the the thing that kind of kills me is how how the cult of these Silicon Valley entrepreneurs really relies on the myth of their originality. It's like, man, this guy's wandering the streets of New York, coming up with the business model for Facebook. You know, 1983. Um, something, but what something like, why yeah. why can the mood company become a reality? The Mood Corporation should be like, shouldn't that be a like a like a drama series on HBO? <laughs> like, it's like very Westworld. Yeah, it's, um, very, yeah. it's also yeah, it is also very Westworld. Um, yeah, well, he was barely getting by. I mean, he was he was he was not a functioning, fully functioning person. Like, it's it's just it's just um, an updating of of the older idea. Um, yeah, it would have been cool if he if he tried it could have been Mark Zuckerberg. Um, so I think we are at the point where we are opening up to questions um, and we have a few of them so far. Uh, so let's get started with that. Um, we have one question. Um, why do you think the work of Simulmatics and their more successful descendants in Silicon Valley is looked upon by so many with awe rather than fear? What does it say about our obsession with getting better at manipulation? Um. That's a really interesting question. I, I actually think that a big piece of the awe has to do with, I, and I've, I've made this argument a lot in lectures that I give, but I also make it in um, the first season of a podcast that, that I did that came out this year called The Last Archive. Um, I teach a, a course at Harvard on the history of evidence and in it, I trace the the um, the decline of the mystery, which is the you know the medieval mystery, the idea that God only God can know things, and all we, our job is to just look for signs about what God's trying to tell us. The people can't really know things, 
um, you know, that, that are replaced by priests. Or, priests can kind of know things because they can read the signs better. Um, when the mystery is replaced by the fact, and then facts um, are sort of replaced by quantification of the age of the number, but that we are living now in an age of data, which is, an, I argue, a return to the age of mystery. Like, hmm. we can't actually know things anymore. Only computers can know things. Um, that, that data is a realm of knowledge, like by definition, the way that we use that term colloquially now, it's a set of facts so big and set of numbers so big that we can't actually process, humans can't actually process it. We need a machine to process that amount of information. Look for signs. Yeah, so therefore we're just like, so the, in, this, in this conception, take it or leave it, you know, the Silicon Valley people really are the priests, right? They're the ones who can read the signs um and communicate with the machines and the rest of us are just we're just lay, lay people and they're the clerics and I, I i you know the age of mystery mystery is is incommensurate with democracy you can't live in a democracy if if you don't know things right like we have to be able to know as citizens in order to execute our obligations as voters so that some of the kind of <laughs> enemy and helplessness and alienation and confusion and epistemological crisis and you know what Joe Biden likes to call the existential election you know really is like well how do we know things anymore um that this is a crisis that is produced by yielding to machines the mm -hmm. capacity to discern what's true and what's not true mm -hmm. um here is another question do you think your enlightening research on this forgotten company will allow for a better understanding of the early development of data science in relation to politics? Um, I think so, but only because there really hasn't been that much work done. <laughs> yeah, like I don't mean to just like magnify the importance of my own work, but just to say, you know, there are like the history of science and history of technology in this field called STS, science technology studies, is incredibly rich in um, and wonderful. There's a lot of work that goes on in that field, but I think that most people, you go into like a bookstore, uh, you go into the New York Public Library bookshop, you don't immediately see a, a bunch of books that help explain to you um, how we got here technologically. Uh, and if if you do, they tend to be like techie books, right? There, there, there is much kind of participating in the reverence for this yeah, stuff as uh, anything else, uh, right? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. So I think that you know any any work that you know pauses and says these guys didn't invent this stuff in two thousand and two, like <laughs> it just didn't happen. Um, you know, the guy who was the chairman of the research board for Simulmatics coined the phrase social network and developed the you know all the kind of mathematical modeling sorry i'm running my dogs in the room all the mathematical modeling that lies behind facebook um so providing a history for uh, a realm in american life that insists that it has no history seems to me quite an urgent project it's like why i wrote the book like it's really important to silicon valley's sense of itself and not to that of every individual who works there but like i don't mean to overgeneralize but like as a place, as an idea, like the way like California is a land of possibility or it used to be, um, Silicon Valley is is a place that has no past. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's, that's just crap, like that's nonsense. So any work that I think provides some insight into that past is is helpful. Has your research, has your research led you to change your own behaviors at all online or off? <laughs> um, I, I mean, no, I like I, I, I'm actually surprised to hear you say no. Yeah, I mean, well, I, so I'm not on social media. I've never had like a Twitter account or a Facebook. I noticed you weren't tagged on Twitter. And I was like, I wonder if she's like a, a not Twitter person. Yeah, I, I, someone showed me recently that I had like a fake, like a imposter account on Instagram or something. But, like I've never, I've never done that stuff. Cause I don't, I think, I think it's, uh, I think it's quite hostile to, to human well being. Um, and flourishing, and I, I think it's profoundly undermined the institutions of higher education and journalism and uh, civic associations, which are institutions I'm deeply concerned about and really care about. So, uh, but it's like not like a sacrifice. Like I don't, I don't, I have no desire to do any of those. Like I don't want to be on Facebook. Like it wasn't like, oh, I really wish I could do that. And then I just thought, no, the right thing to do is to abstain. Um, You're a better just, person. Than me. <laughs> no, I just I'm not interested. Um, but like, 
you know, like everybody else, I kind of like it when Netflix gives me a good suggestion of what I should watch next. Like, I, you know, I recognize that there's predictive analytics in my day, every minute of my day, like for all of us. Um, I suspect I have maybe less engagement with a lot of those things than many people do. But I think we, like, for instance, you know, what is it like one in five Americans has a Twitter account? Very few of those people tweet about politics. And of the people who tweet about politics, 90% of all tweets are written by 10% of all political tweeters. Like we think, I think people who are on Twitter think like everybody's on Twitter and everything important is happening there, but it's not the real world. It's not, like it's just not true. So um, I don't know. I hear that. I don't, uh, yeah. No, no, I have to say, you know, when I was, when I was hearing about the, um, some of the the visions of Simulmatics and how you know it could get you to um, to choose the dishwasher that it wanted you to choose, or just to like predict human behavior and influence human behavior on these granular levels. And part of that felt quaint, where I was like, "Oh, it's so much more complicated than that." But you know, part of me was like, "No, actually, that's pretty much how it works right now." And it's really amazing how much they you know this this vision that they had is like playing out on a granular level in my day to day life. Yeah, and I, th I think it is useful to think about what's different about that, right? Like, one of the reasons that, you know, big city newspapers or big cities had so many newspapers and had such a wide readership and actually had um, a fairly moderate political tone was, you know, your Maytag, you want to sell washing machines. Westinghouse also wants to sell washing machines. So you take out, you know, a full page ad on page three of the New York Times with all your Maytag machines. Um, you can do that because you think most people need a washing machine and people see that ad and there's like, oh, there's only so many washing machines. I guess I'm gonna get a Maytag. Um, but you, you also have seen the news in that newspaper that everybody else has seen, um, that it, it creates a common experience you know, weirdly of consumer culture at the same time as, a, you know, the, the information culture. Um, but, and I don't need to be like weird, you know, weirdly nostalgic about that, but it's kind of nice that you uh, maybe saw this, even saw the same ads in a day that someone else did. Like, I, you know, you, you remember when you were a kid and everybody was singing the same shampoo song. It was like, why? Why is there something use dumb shampoo? With yeah, people yeah around. like you, you, you shared a world with people. Um, this guy who was the chairman of the research board of Simulmatics, who was really prescient and quite brilliant, in 1968 wrote an essay about how, you know, by 2018, everybody will have a personal newspaper. And he was a political scientist. And he said, you know, it occurs to me, it'll be impossible to have political parties when you can have a newspaper that's generated by your own interest in the news. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because political parties rely on a com uh, you, know, you know on shared interests that are cultivated by the technologies of communication and the practices of journalism we have here mm -hmm. in 1960. Um, so I forget what the question was. Now I'm just now I'm just blathering. But um, but I think it's I think it's worth thinking about measuring that distance. Mm. Um, what is your perspective on the actual effectiveness, effectiveness of Simulmatic's work? For example, did Simulmatic's make any difference in the Kennedy campaign or by predicting riots or in, or in Vietnam? Yeah, well, the riot prediction stuff, I mean, they did, then they did kind of back of the envelope. Um, they did a lot of interviews with people um, and they did a lot of like public opinion surveys, but they didn't do computational modeling of riots. Other places did like the T Detroit Police Department did. They had a computer that was doing predictive work based on crime statistics. Um, I would say about the race riot prediction stuff that it continues down to this day with predictive policing. And we know that it doesn't work. We know that we know exactly the way in which it works badly, which is to say, you know, what that kind of work does is say, here's a neighborhood where um, there have recently been a lot of arrests. So you should spend more time patrolling that neighborhood because there must be a lot of crime there. So then you spend more time patrolling that neighborhood and because the police are there more often, they arrest more people. Now that's gonna be an, an impoverished neighborhood. We know that. And so then those people, when they're arrested, if, 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 if they're brought down to the precinct um, and charged, they're gonna have a really hard time setting bail. They're gonna have a really hard time hiring a lawyer. So they're gonna be disproportionately charged and then convicted of crimes. 
So now, now your database is going to tell you that's a neighborhood where there are a lot of criminals. A lot of people who are in prison now come from that neighborhood. You should spend more time there. So you just spiral down until you've completely destroyed a neighborhood. That's what predictive policing does. Um, does that work? No, that just destroys neighborhoods. Um, uh, it, it's just a, it's just an amplification machine for racism. Mm -hmm. um, so that's you know, you know I'm goofy and smiling and making fun of this stuff, but like this stuff is really bad. Like the way in which it works in our world. Sure, it's nice when Netflix says, I think you would really like this new um, Elizabeth Moss series. That's <laughs> cute, but you know, I, I'm, I don't have a police knocking on my door saying, you know, who's in there? Like, I, you, that's the other side of it. And, you know, there's consumer choices are one thing, but social outcomes um, are another. And that's where I find myself um, astonished at the degree to which so many institutions have given over their own obligations to make decisions about what's right and what's wrong, who's guilty, who's innocent, who needs help, who doesn't need help um, based on algorithms. But then what is your take on the, their effectiveness in the Kennedy campaign? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I got all of this. really wear the secret weapon? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I tend to think that, um, so there are four things that the campaign objectively claims credit for. One uh, is um, convincing the Democratic National Committee's platform committee at the 1960 convention to, to adopt what is this, the, the then strongest civil rights plank by any party ever. Um, some Maddox claims credit for that. And I, I think there's a lot of evidence that people there had read their report on black voters um, and civil rights. But again, that's August of 1960. So what's been going on in 1960 since February are the sit-ins that began at the lunch counters, um, you know, um, of Texas A&M students, you know, black students across the South have been staging sit-ins sit -ins and protests of segregation and Jim Crow um, and beginning the work of, of, of protesting um, uh, disenfranchisement. That's been going on, you know, it's on the news every night. Like how hard was it? Like was the Democratic Party at that point, did they really need these numbers? Like, but, um, but then they claim credit for convincing Kennedy to be, to be forthright about his religion and and what I thought it was interesting about that was it's not it wasn't that like oh people will like to hear you talk about the fact that you're Catholic it's that if you talk about the fact that you're Catholic people will attack you and then other people especially Jewish people and black people will like feel some sense of solidarity with you because of those attacks and that's how you win. Yeah and that's where you know it is interesting because I think Kennedy was very reticent to do that. And I don't know, I'm not, you know, there's a great biography of, of Kennedy coming up by my colleague, Fred Logval. Um, he would know the answer to this, but I don't, you know, what were the, who were the people, you know, tapping Kennedy on the shoulder and saying, Jack, Jack, you got to talk about, people think you're enthralled to the Pope, like you got to talk about this. I don't know who those people were, but the, some of the Alex guys did have the numbers, right? Like they did, they had a, they had a, they had a simulation of election where they could say, if you say this, here's what these voters will do. Um, and if you say this, here's what these voters will do. I mean, roughly they could say that. Um, so we, you know, we really, we can't, we can't know. Like, do we know for the person who asked the question, like, do you feel confident that you know what role Cambridge Analytica played in the 2015 Brexit vote or mm -hmm. in the 2016 election? Do you feel confident that you know whether Facebook and the misinformation that it allowed on um, its users to post and repost Really influence the outcome like how would we know that what would be the empirical study that could answer that question for us i don't think we could answer that question now empirically and i we certainly not i'm it'd be cool if someone could figure out a way to answer it for 1960 but i don't know how to yeah yeah um i want to ask one more question just because it is really specific um can you talk a bit about one of the simulmatics Simul team members eugene burdick and his bizarre and wide-ranging career um, yes, Eugene Burdick was um, a professor of political science at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, he was also a best-selling novelist um, and a, just a kind of uh, a gadabout, of fame, like a very sexy public intellectual, like public intellectuals in the 1950s, I guess. I'm trying to think of any of them, any others of them who were 
known to be so sexy. He was so sexy. He was also a famous scuba diver um, that um, Bounty Nail, which is now owned, I believe, by Paps, had him be the spokesman for um, one of its beers that was called um, A Manlier Brew. And in the ads, like their TV ads, he's like scuba diving. And then he comes up and he's searching for a manlier brew and he takes it back to his his bungalow where he's typing his next novel where you know the girls who were his students are lining up for office hours like dreamily looking in on him like who is that guy now i, I mean thank god there isn't that guy but like that's a cool interesting character he's fantastic he's the guy who refuses to work for somalatics and writes the dystopian novel about the company great um, Jill, thank you so much for talking with us. This is fascinating. Um, thank you so much for doing this. It was so fun to speak with you. Yeah, and thank you to the New York Public Library. And I hope everyone who's watching has a great evening. All right, good night, everyone. Bye. Black text on white background, New York Public Library, Lion logo, 125 years. Learn more about the New York Public Library, nypl.org.